Can you, uh, with the, uh, it's extremely pleased to have um, Emily Lovell to um, lead the uh, panel on perspectives of teaching open source. Um, so I want to quickly introduce uh, uh, Emily and then Emily can introduce uh, her panel. So Emily Lovell is an OSPO incubator fellow at UC Santa Cruz. Her research and teaching use novel domains to invite broader participation in computing, with her postdoctoral work focusing on sharing open source with high schoolers. Emily previously served on faculty at Berea College, where she developed and taught courses on open source contribution and computational craft. She has also co-taught physical computing workshops at a variety of venues domestically and abroad, including outreach programs, design schools, museums, and festivals. Motivated by a desire to make e-textiles more accessible, Emily designed a low-cost, pre-programmed, sewable <laughs> um, uh, microcontroller known as the Lily Tiny, which is open source and has been commercially available as part of the LilyPad Arduino product line for 10 years now. Uh, she has a, now what is an SM? It's a master's degree. It's <laughs> a master's degree <laughs> in, in, in media arts and sciences from the MIT lab and a PhD in computer science from UC Santa Cruz. Emily lives in the Santa Cruz mountains with a rescue pub, Fira. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you, Emily, um, and, uh, uh, you know, please go ahead. Thank you, Carlos. I didn't know that my dog was going to get a teacher <laughs> shout out. Um, well, um, thank you all for joining us. I'm going to just give really brief introduction to my panelists and then let them talk a little bit more about themselves to kick things off. Um, to give you a little bit of context, um, I think Carlos mentioned I was uh, on faculty at Berea College for three years, so I was teaching university students. My um, research uh, as a grad student has been in computing education, so that's how I met um, a lot of the folks that you'll be meeting today on the panel uh, through a community of folks that are really supporting faculty in teaching open source. Um, and so, yeah, I'm gonna kind of briefly introduce them, ask them to introduce themselves. Uh, we'll be talking about university uh, open source teaching to uh, narrow it down a little bit today. And we have four panelists joining us. So in person, we have Tony Wasserman, who's a professor at CMU Silicon Valley. Um, we also remotely have uh, Heidi Ellis, who you can see on the screen right now from Western New England, um, Greg Hislop from Drexel, He's waving. I don't. Is there a way for us to pin oh, all yeah, the four of them? I will try. Sorry, I did actually have an issue with. <laughs> we're um, actually, not hybrid. Yeah, we're figuring out hybrid. Sorry, everyone. Um, oh, let's see. Katie, um, Greg Kislop from Drexel, and then also Lori Postner from uh, Nassau Community College. So I'm really excited because these uh, faculty represent a really diverse cross section of institutions, and look forward to sharing a little bit with you all about teaching open source. All right. Okay. Can I ask everyone who's not on the panel if they could uh, take turn off their um, screens for right now, so that our will only be seeing the folks who are um, aside from the ASL interpreter, please. Um, so who else? So Gregory. So Mel, if you could turn off your screen. Hi, Mel. <laughs> Hope you're feeling well. Um, and then otherwise, uh, I think we're good. I got everybody. Okay. Now we got everybody. Is this good for everyone here? Okay, great, thank you. All right, um, let's start. Maybe Greg, could you uh, first start by just introducing your, yourself and uh, how you got involved in teaching open source and just a very brief background. You're, you're muted, it uh, looks like Greg. <laughs> I always forget that. Um, so I've been involved with open source for a long time. Um, I don't even know how many years at this point, but it started off with an interest in uh, a better way to teach software engineering to allow students to get exposure to complexity and scale and um, long lived projects and all the things that come along with that. 
And over time, I got really interested in humanitarian open source and the benefits of exposing students to computing for social good. And, uh, and also in the, the community uh, components of open source and um, essentially giving students exposure to thinking about software and software production and software work in a different way than they might have uh, before they got that exposure. Thanks, how about Heidi, can you go next? Sure, I'm Heidi Ellis. I'm a professor at Western New England University and I got involved uh, with open source, again, the humanitarian aspect of it uh, way back in like 2005, 2004. And since then I have involved students in multiple kinds of classes. And some of the most recent things that we're trying is having um, open source projects that are supported and managed by faculty members. So, and I'm glad to be here. Thanks, Heidi. Lori? Hi, I'm Lori Postner. I'm from NASA Community College, which is part of the SUNY State New University of New York system. Um, and I'm located in Long Island, which is just east of New York City. Um, thanks to Heidi and Greg, I've been involved in open source since 2012. And Heidi had mentioned these education Educational projects. I'm on the coordinating committee of Libre Food Pantry, which is an open source community that's trying to build software for on campus food banks. And my research aspect or more interest is really with regard to how HFOS can be used to help broaden participation in computing. All right, Tony. Yeah, I need to put my mic on. No, we can hear you. Good. So I'll take this off. So, first, uh, it's good to be in, back in Santa Cruz. Uh, my son is a banana slug. Uh, <laughs> graduate so um, I've been on this campus a lot of times and um, the background that I, the zoom background I added is a photo I took of the uh, beach boardwalk uh, so uh, you can see the big dipper the famous old wooden roller coaster so great so oh, about open source so I've been doing uh, open source actually since the late 1970s uh, because uh, it came out of Berkeley Unix and uh, so we built uh, open source software to run on top of Berkeley Unix and uh, had a BSD license, of course. Uh, then I left the university to start a company. And so we were, I think, the second company after Sun Microsystems uh, to put open source software in a commercial product. Um, and at some later date, I joined Carnegie Mellon in Silicon Valley. And then uh, starting in 2006, I've taught a course on open source software. Our students are graduate students, some with a product management, business oriented focus, some with a software engineering, more technical focus. So teaching a class that makes them all happy uh, is kind of a fun thing to do. Uh, and uh, so uh, I've done that for a while and uh, taught late last summer and again this coming spring. So. Uh, keeps me out of trouble. <laughs> great, that's a, a great segue to the first question I really wanted to start with, uh, which is that open source contribution can be infused into computing curricula in a lot of different ways. So this can range from a single assignment that exposes students to open source, uh, all the way to year long capstone courses for seniors in computer science. Uh, could you each briefly summarize the course or courses that you've taught around open source and help the rest of us understand what does an open source course look like or what can it look like? Anyone who'd like to start can. <laughs> uh, I'll start if you'd like. Um, so I'm currently teaching a course called Open Source Software Engineering. Uh, it's an upper level undergraduate course and um, it, it's um, taken primarily by software engineering and computer science students. And the, the heart of the course is for students to participate in open source projects, um, primarily humanitarian, but I allow students to do other, other sorts of projects as well. So these are existing ongoing projects that they that grab their interest. Uh, and that's combined with in-class work that introduces them to the history of open source, introduces them to how to approach an open source project, how to evaluate an open source project that they might possibly contribute to. 
um, to other topics like copyright and um, licensing and so on and so forth to, to give them a real understanding of open source and how it works. Talk about open source in business, talk about the evolution of open source over time, a whole variety of topics like that. Thanks, Greg. Okay, since we seem to be going in introduction order, I will continue on that. <laughs> right. So, um, so I typically teach, I started by teaching a software engineering course, and we've been able to expand this into a two course sequence of software engineering followed by a capstone course. And in the software engineering course, I typically use it as an exploration, have students understand the community, um, get involved, figure out how what the communication is, look at is there a roadmap, what does the issue tracker look like, and basically become familiar with the project. Uh, and if, if we get that far, try to identify places that they can go ahead and possibly make a contribution. I have to cover all of the standard software engineering topics like requirements, design, architecture, and so forth. So what I try to do then is to use, use examples from open source projects that I'm working with so that students under, can see a real world example as opposed to something that, that's more classroom bound. In the second class, I run it as a software project. And so I, we have a 15 week term. I put students into groups of somewhere between four and five, and we run three sprints throughout the semester where they get to define the work product. We use a board, an issue board where students define what they're gonna do. We have board reviews and, and we basically run it as, a, um, as, a soft, as an agile project. Right. I guess I'm up next. Yeah. Um, so I am currently teaching a mobile app development course. So as a two year school, we don't have the software engineering courses or those senior level courses. So it's been a bit of a challenge trying to figure out where we can integrate these concepts into a two year program. Um, so we have a third or fourth semester course. So it can be taken either semester as long as they've had CS1 and CS2 um, on Android app development. And what we had originally had students was writing their own apps. What we migrated to is that there is a single app that the students have been working on from semester to semester, which is a open source project that for our on campus food pantry. Um, so we actually have had one of the early on um, on campus food pantries in the state university system in New York. And our students have been really developing based on the needs of the food pantry. Um, we have a 15 semester, 15 week semester. We start work about the seventh week. So they need the first part to really kind of get up to speed on just the different paradigm of doing Android development. And then we really start with having teams and, and follow that agile um, kind of model. What we've found is that just learning Git and the Git workflow is um, a really big stumbling block for our students. So we are now actually trying to back that into our CS2 and our CS2 instructors are actually introducing Git and Git workflow and just the basic concepts of that in the CS2 so that when they come into that mobile app class, they already have some familiarity with it. Hey, Tony. So yeah, there's a, several things. So the open source course is an elective and it's evolved over time because early on, uh, and to a lesser extent still today, the reality of open source. I mean, the law that I made up is what percentage of your work can you do using only open source software? And that number got to be pretty high, but for anybody who has an iPhone, that number has dropped. Uh, but the idea of, can I use LibreOffice? And so one of the rules in the class is that any work product that you submit has to be done with open source. And because that's the reality of it. So they get to use really good products like OBS for creating videos and it's all project-based. So each individual or each small group of students can pick a project that lets the business people study how open source project offices work and lets the technical people join some project out there that they find on GitHub. And so we get an entirely uh, diverse collection of projects that, that get done each time. And, if, and the other thing we do during class 
I rely heavily on bringing in luminaries from the open source community. Um, we used to do that physically, but we don't have to. Uh, when Nietzsche gets here later, she'll, she can tell you that she's been my guest uh, a few times uh, in that course. And so again, it, it introduces students to the idea of an open source community, it gives them different perspectives from different people. They don't just have to listen to me, uh, which is a good thing. Uh, so um, so it, it, it works out pretty well, and it's a semester course. Um, so with really, graduate students, is that Graduate right? students. Uh, they're all looking for master students. The ones in our program are software management, but I will always take a few software engineering mm -hmm. students, masters in software engineering, so that we get this interesting mix. In the software management program, we do something else. The, the software management program uh, takes uh, students who've got an undergraduate degree, typically in computer science, and the students usually have come from India or China, uh, and they want to become product managers. They don't want to spend their lives writing code. So we developed a sequence of courses, and <clears throat> plus an elective. Uh, the elective is called the first time manager. And so one of the things that the first time manager has to do is figure out what the development tools are gonna to look like. What's the environment gonna be for the people? So, you know, you get to choose open source tools as well as proprietary ones. The other courses, there's a product definition and validation class that I'm teaching at 12, 10 in there, uh, and a uh, software product strategy class. And open source comes up routinely in that because in software product strategy, one of the issues is how long does it take you to build the product that you've envisioned? And if you can use open source components and the like, then you're writing less code and you're using trusted code. And how long does it take you to bring the product to market? Because that's really important for a startup. So again, if you make choices that include open source, you can get to market faster in most cases. So, so it kind of finds its way into uh, several of the uh, courses that, that I teach. Well, well, Tony, you are just leading from one question to the next without knowing it. My next question um, is, uh, you know, we're all here today because we are invested in open source, but why teach it at the university level, which you hinted at some reasons for that. Um, so, but kind of when writing this question, I was thinking like, okay, well, anybody can become a contributor. Any, like the resources exist online now, right? Um, so why, I mean, there's a lot of reasons, but I'd love to hear you all um, speak to this. Uh, why, why teach it to college students and graduate students? Anybody can jump in for the rest of these questions, yeah. It's new to them. It's new to them, yeah. I mean, that's, you know, you go to college to learn something. So here's something you should learn. And now that open source has become mainstream, mm -hmm. and when I first started teaching this, I had people tell me, oh, we don't use open source. And, you know, they're part-time students from industry. And I would turn to them and say, you want to bet? Mm -hmm. um, and so suddenly they learned open source and suddenly they're, company was forced to do some open source and they became the expert in their company. Uh, so, uh, you know, people have heard of it, but haven't actually put their hands on it. They haven't downloaded and used Drupal or WordPress or open office or some of these things. And the class makes them see that this stuff is not science fiction. Mm -hmm. Yes. And my students report that their contributions to open source because they're visible are have significant impact in their interview process mm -hmm. that they were able to show not just the use of the tools but the fact that they were able to utilize the tools in, in order to problem solve in a real world environment they i and i just got an email from a student who was in my last spring's capstone and he was saying it was so helpful to be able to demonstrate to to future employers his true capabilities. Uh, but it goes beyond that, uh, because when you're looking for a job, mm -hmm. you can then point to your GitHub page and mm -hmm. say, here are all my contributions. People exactly. can go look at your code 
And if you're part of a project and there are people from industry on that project, they say, hey, she's a pretty good developer. We should hire her. So there's a whole um, uh, employment path that comes out of uh, the visibility of students' contributions to open source projects. Apparently, one of the employers asked my student to walk through his code line by line and explain it, which I thought was going into a lot of detail. <laughs> so one of the things I think a little different from my perspective is that if you're teaching this in a upper level course at a four year school, students know what's coming down the pike, right? They hear the chatter of the students who are older than they are. When we only have students for two years, they don't know what the discipline's really about. They don't know what's down the line. And this is an opportunity for us to bring something and give them that understanding of this is the career you're choosing and letting them you know, get that glimpse in, which a lot of our students at a two-year level didn't have. Um, so it's, it's a very different educational experience, especially the way our CS1 and CS2 and data structures courses were very prescribed. They, you know, they had projects, there was a definitive endpoint, the teachers know the answers to every question that you're going to ask. This opens up the world of what is what is development really like in a constantly moving field. And they are now getting an opportunity at the two-year level before they transfer to understand teamwork, professional tools and processes, the changing nature of the field, um, as well as what everyone else has said about building that online resume um, and work for potential employers. But we were really looking at it from a perspective of trying to open their eyes to what lays ahead of them and to really try to get them excited about what they're going to be able to do later on. Yeah, I think that's a really great point, Lori, and a really valuable perspective. My first experience ever um, really teaching open source was at a workshop um, between Hartnell College and CSU Monterey Bay with students who were doing a CS degree in three years. So it was a very similar um, kind of students are combining a community college and a four-year college experience, very condensed. Um, and that was exactly what I found so compelling about the one day experience that I had um, was all these things you're speaking to, Lori, about showing students everything that's possible and seeing how excited um, and how exciting that can be. Greg, do you have anything to add? I agree with what everybody said. It's um, I'll just underline one point that's really came from Tony, and that is for people who live in the open source world, we forget that the broader world doesn't understand open source. I keep expecting that to change, and I think it will eventually, but it still hasn't. You know, most of my students, for instance, these are seniors, and Drexel's a co-op school, so our typical student is with us for five years. They do three six-month stints in industry. So I, by the time I get them, they typically have a year, year and a half work experience in addition to all their coursework. They don't know that there are jobs in open source. They think it's all volunteer. The notion that somebody would hire them and assign them to work on an open source project or that a, you know, a large open source project might hire them directly is completely news to them. You know, faculty, many computer science faculty, most computer science faculty know very little about open source and how the world of open source actually works. So there's a, a need for even just very fundamental education. And, and then Laurie and Heidi talked about some of the broader things that you, you cannot get students into so many aspects of what it really means to be a software professional until they've worked on large projects or seen large projects operate. Open source is just a gold mine for being able to expose students to those things. To, to add to that, the, um, the growth of commercial open source has been very, very rapid. There are lots and lots of companies now that are venture funded and that uh, some have gone public. Uh, so that there are, in fact, uh, real jobs with companies that um, either are doing open source or claim to be doing open source. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so they become uh, opportunities for people when they're finished with school. Absolutely. Yeah, one thing I want to add to from my own experience that has been touched on a little bit, but I don't think anyone's spoken to in depth is uh, how different it is for students to be part of a community when they're in uh, an open source class. And I think even for me as an educator, finding like a community of educators teaching open source was sort of like this meta reflection of like the whole culture um, that really also helps to hook me in a way 
Um, because again, I think that that hooks into uh, some of the things that have have come up a little bit, or especially around broadening uh, participation in computing and uh, different ways that people can can find their way in a supportive atmosphere. Um, so the next question I wanted to pose to you all is, uh, I know that in my own experience as uh, an instructor, teaching an open source course is really different from teaching like a core programming class or a data structures class. And I was hoping that um, you could all share your thoughts a little bit on what's different or unique about an open source contribution geared class uh, compared to uh, more traditional, more traditionally structured computing course. Um, I'll point to two things. One is you have to shift to a sort of a co-learner model. Um, you can't be the source of all knowledge. If you have students, I have students working on a series of different open source projects in a given term. I'm not the expert on those projects and that you have to you have to set their expectations differently and you have to understand your own role differently uh, in order to be able to teach that kind of a course. You have to be more flexible. You, know, you have to be more humble in, in some ways, you know, for, for relative to what some people are used to as instructors. Yeah, I'm going to jump in on that because what I was going to say is you have to be comfortable or at least not absolutely terrified of things not going as planned. Um, and I would say from a teaching perspective, the biggest challenge I have is I find it much harder to grade. Um, I find there's a lot of prep in terms of trying to, at least for my students, have things in good bite-sized pieces and really structuring in a way that's not overwhelming for them. Um, and as from a student perspective, I think it's a real switch for them to have an unscripted class um, where the teacher really does not know the answer and is going to model how to find the answer, which I think is invaluable for students because they're so used to seeing the teacher always knowing the answer and it makes it look easy. Like, of course I know the answer and I you write up the answer. Students don't realize the background that goes into that. So when there is a question you can't answer and then you model, okay, I don't know the answer. How would I go about finding it out? I think that is hugely invaluable for students. It does require though, a, a reset of expectations because many students come in and part of the reason they're in computing is they like things black and white and they wanna know the answer. And when you're standing in front of class and don't have the answer, they can sometimes get frustrated. And so being able to set expectations up front that if they're going to join an, act, an ongoing project that, that A, I'm not gonna be able to script their progress through and B, I'm not gonna have the answers is, is really critical up front. So yes, um, I think for me, one way to characterize it is that the traditional computer science courses are self-contained. And I think that was the, the point that a couple of you made. Whereas an open source class, you have to interact with the world. Mm -hmm. You become part of a community. You have to go and look at projects. You know, one of the things that we talked about is how do you look at a project out there and find something that's of interest to you that has, uh, good um, chemistry about it. That is that, you know, there aren't 200 things on the to-do list that are unassigned. Uh, you know, if you can see a well-managed project, learn how to tell a well-managed project from a poorly managed project. Uh, so some of those things come into play. It, it, it makes you think of when you're out there taking a job after you're done with school, you're working with a bunch of people. Right, you don't get to sit in your cubicle forever and not interact with them. And open source is a really good way to see how that works. Yeah, I think that's such a great point that it's really opening up students to this whole outside world. And I think um, one of the things that really like delighted me about teaching open source for the first time was seeing all of my students huddled around one laptop to draft like Slack messages to the Firefox uh, dev tools team because my students were contributing in parallel with Heidi's students during uh, one semester and that was like a really big part of the course for them was learning how to communicate with developers and they're very aware um, that they're like dropping into a, a situation with people who have a lot of expertise and mentorship to offer. Um, so I think that that is yeah I think students interfacing beyond the classroom is such a 
really valuable thing about open source, for sure. So the next couple of questions I want to do kind of like a uh, rapid fire style. Uh, wanted to ask something that has challenged each of you about teaching open source. Uh, learning. There's, there's always so much to learn. I mean, that's a that's a plus and it's fun, but it's also a challenge because it's time demand. Greg took my answer. Finding time to learn new technologies. <laughs> yep. Licensing. Licensing. Right. Mm -hmm. And the fact that licenses are changing and that commercial companies are abandoning traditional OSI licenses mm -hmm. and having service side licenses. How does it bring in an attorney uh, to uh, help us uh, those for those classes? Because um, it, there are subtleties. Right. I can see how that would be really valuable. Yeah. And, and I, I'm going to go back and talk about my expectations and, and mm. sort of student management that um, that students really sometimes struggle and sometimes that struggle is necessary and it's good, but they do get frustrated. And so having being able to help them navigate that can be a challenge. And sometimes the projects just take a left hand turn and halfway through your semester and you're like okay <laughs> and so being able to be flexible is really is really critical when you're interacting with an ongoing project because things change definitely yeah. i mean, okay. I may oh, throw ahead. one more thing in there so um the way we're doing it is that i'm actually the maintainer of the the project so the amount of time that i spend reviewing students merge request in a timely manner so there isn't a huge backlog for the rest of the class um and that now there's all this code sitting out there there's not in the upstream repo that has been a huge challenge for me is a time management issue yeah that makes a lot of sense really different than having students engage in a project where somebody else is managing all the prs yeah for sure so i want to add one more thing to follow up on, on emily which is that when you're dealing with a project and a team you make a contribution, it has to be reviewed. They have to decide whether or not they're going to accept it. And so here they are in the next to last week of the class, waiting to see if their code is going to be accepted and merged or whether it's going to get bounced. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that idea of, you know, how do I work with this team and make it work and, and follow the suggestions that come back uh, that's the, the uh, an important step and a challenge for the students because you, most of the students I get have been you know A plus students for their whole lives uh, and uh, and now they're in a place where they're dependent on other people to get it right. Yeah, I think someone asked um, a, a relevant question in the Zoom chat, which I can jump back and forth. If you have questions throughout, please feel free to drop them in uh, Zoom, or I think someone's also monitoring Slack, um, and we'll kind of mix them in. Um, so Jay asked in the Zoom chat, how do you teach handling negative community feedback, which I think is a really uh, relates to what Tony was just saying about students getting feedback on their like, PRs so and all that. One of the reasons why we have focused in the humanitarian area is because those projects typically have a very welcoming environment that they they embrace students and for generally the communication is um, is positive. And as far as negative feedback, usually what I do is when it came in, which was rarely was to talk about it as a class mm -hmm. and talk about the comment and why was the comment made and where where is it coming from and, and what is the rationale and how do you respond to that? Do you know what is the appropriate professional response? So use it as a as a teaching moment for professionalism. Mm -hmm. Anyone else has <laughs> and encourage and it and, and and to also encourage the students. Uh, students are incredibly motivated mm -hmm. by feedback from the community. If I, I, I have often stated that if somebody in the community says job well done, mm -hmm. 
that is better than an A. Students are just so motivated. And so if there's negative feedback, I really try to work and, and reinforce the positives with that, with that student because they, they will sometimes take it a little personally. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, you make a good point. And when you look at some of the better known large projects, there is some history of abuse and mm -hmm. negativity. Uh, the Linux kernel project and uh, uh, some of the MIT projects have uh, been particularly well known for that. And certain individuals have been called out for, uh, you know, poor behavior. And, you know, this is the way of our world, unfortunately. And uh, so uh, being able to, to address it, maybe you shouldn't work on that project. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a reason why there's a very small percentage of women in open source, because they, they tended to get beaten up on it. And they would say, who needs this? And, you know, you can't really argue with them on, on that point. Uh, so uh, uh, I do recommend that they read Joan o. Bacon's The Art of Community, mm -hmm. which I think is really an outstanding book. And there's a free downloadable version of it, at least there was, um, you know, to talk about how to build communities and manage them and participate in them. Um, but, you know, you do get a certain amount of it. And, and Heidi, I think your idea of discussing it in class is a really um, excellent technique. Yeah, I found it really helpful too as an instructor to leverage the, you know, the instructor community to, as others have mentioned, be thoughtful about the projects that I'm going to engage my students in. Um, because, for instance, when I was first developing my course, I reached out to a mailing list of instructors. Um, somebody responded. I linked up with Heidi and another faculty member. Um, who were all starting courses at the same time. And it was so helpful because somebody was able to say like, oh, I've already vetted this particular community. And there's, you know, a couple of like sort of touchstone developers who are willing to be talking to students. And it made such a tremendous difference in my students' experience. And to then build, I mean, I, I was very fortunate to teach a course back to back two semesters in a row. So it enabled me also to build relationships with um, a couple of developers on the Mozilla side of things um, to, you know, really support some of these challenges that we're talking about, having quick feedback, having positive feedback, um, having encouragement sort of just in time when things are feeling frustrating. Um, definitely. Anything else to add? Anyone on that? How about um, something that has surprised uh, you about teaching open source? So we talked about the challenges. How about something that surprised you? Maybe even a pleasantly surprised you about teaching open source. Yeah, I, I will say um, I've been more than once been surprised, routinely been surprised by how good students do in, in um, jumping in and going somewhere with getting mm -hmm. themselves connected to an open source project. You know, I, um, I, I'm surprised sometimes, at, pleasantly surprised at their successes. Right. I just, I got hooked because students just learned so much more than I ever expected them to do. And they would go on and do such incredible things. And I found it a strong reminder about, as, as Tony was saying, the contained classroom, that it is contained, it's, it's packaged, and that by taking the, the container off, by opening things up, you, the amount of student learning is, is immense. And I would say initially it's so daunting for students that how quickly it can go from those first two weeks of it being daunting and overwhelming to them just flourishing. So it's, it's amazing to me that my students will be teaching me and the rest of the class about all these new things that they've learned. And when I go to the next semester, I'm quite honest when I say, I don't know how the code works because your previous you know, class of this developed all this and it's amazing. And how many students they get, they spend so much more time um, because they're so motivated because they're seeing the relevance of what they're working on it's not just something that is for a grade. 
it's something that's going to actually help other students on our campus, um, students, faculty, staff, you know, our campus community, um, and it's incredible. So one surprise, one surprise that I had uh, last summer before last, uh, I got to teach uh, this course as an experiential learning class to undergraduates. And uh, mostly I had taught graduate students for, for all these years. And I was very pleasantly surprised by uh, how, um, how well the, uh, the undergraduates did uh, with a course that was not all that different from what I taught to the graduate students. So there's a lot of um, interest in learning and I think uh, it showed up there. Well, and it's kind of like this real opportunity to see students rise to the challenge, I think in like this really profound way that we don't always get the opportunity with like a more traditional assignments or at least that's been my experience is it's, yeah, it's so impressive to see students just like, take on things and run with them. I had a student who like at one point said like, oh, is it okay with you if I uh, work with somebody on this chat bot that's related to the project on the side outside of class? And I was like, yeah, like, what can I do to support you in that? Um, so yeah, I think it's really neat to see students uh, just throw themselves in. And I think, I think too, as students, as student learn, I learn. Do you know, mm -hmm. I learn about, about teaching, about my own teaching. It, it causes me to reflect on, okay, so what, what could I do better, as, as you said, to support the progress? Absolutely. So let's say that somebody is interested in engaging students in open source, whether inside or outside of the classroom, but they don't have a full course to devote to it. What is something small that they could start with? Now, a lot of people that, that uh, faculty that we're aware of, including some of us, started with independent studies, you know, or if you have some funding you could do to give students over the summer and get them to work on open source, you know, so, so not, a, not even in a class structure, but working with students outside of class is an easy way for a lot of people to start. Mm -hmm. I, when I was starting sort of developing my software engineering class, we started with a FOSS field trip. And so just a series of about 20, 20 questions, go investigate this project and tell me how many contributors are there? How many commits have there been in the last six months? Just go see what you can learn and then write me a paragraph or two about what you, what you experienced. Do you know, and you don't even have to go any further than that. It exposes students so that they gain some understanding. Um, and it's something that you can have students do. It'll, you know, they may take a couple hours to do it. Not a huge commitment. If they, I go, would... to it, if they go to Open Hub, they can find it real quickly. Mm -hmm. well, right, right. But you don't have to tell them that Open Hub exists. <laughs> well, even if you do, they, they sometimes they'll find the wrong project, do you know, that projects have sub projects. And so it takes them a little bit to do that investigation. Yeah. So I would say starting with some tools. So Git, Git workflow is a great first step of being familiar. So when they do, if you do want to move forward, that they've got that as a little bit of a basis because it makes moving forward more manageable. All great advice. So I know that uh, many of you are involved in research in this space, which is how I know some of you. Uh, what is ahead on the research horizon for teaching open source? Oh, multiple, multiple things. So part of what we've been doing as a group is trying to address that learning curve hump for faculty. For instructors. So one of the things that we're looking at is creating a kit, which is um, a Docker container of an entire project. And combining that with some existing activities that the instructors can use in that container. And, it, and so it handles the unable to download and install the project barrier and it also gives the ability to just reset the darn thing. You know, if students go way wrong and screw something up, you just download the container again. So that's one of the efforts we've been working on. 
we also continue to work on the problem of how to get faculty to get up to speed and be able to teach the learning curve for faculty um, is still a problem. We haven't, we, we, we work on that. We, we, um, we help small numbers of faculty get up to speed, but it's really hard to, to scale that up to a large number of faculty. I don't think we have a good solution to that as yet. So um, my own research has been in evaluation, adoption, and use of open source. Uh, that goes way back. The the uh, you know you, here's a project. You know is is it business ready? Originally we started a project called the business readiness rating, which turned into something called OSS PAL. <laughs> That's my word, OSS PAL. But it was a measure of trying to use some quantitative and qualitative evaluations to look at a project and say good, bad, indifferent, so on. Uh, so uh, that work has uh, has continued uh, at a at a low level, uh, but uh, there are a lot of a lot of other open source research areas that are coming up. Um, when you start to look at rules for machine learning, and uh, you look at uh, how does that algorithm actually work? Is it biased? Is it unbiased? Those kinds of things. I think there's a lot of work that can be done just following where computing in general is going. So another area that we're Security. looking into. Oops. Sorry, go ahead. Did you finish? Yeah, I'm good. Okay, um, another area that we're looking into is how um, having students use open source in the classroom affects both student identity as well as faculty identity. So how does it change their perception of themselves within, from the student perspective within the discipline, but from the faculty perspective of themselves as an educator and pedagogy and all the things that are potentially different than they may have been, how they've been doing their job prior to teaching open source. Right, it's really, yeah, I mean, this speaks to the um, sort of different role of an instructor and particularly being part of maybe a community of other practitioners who are finding their way through this all as well. So that's very interesting. And related to that, if somebody, I'm gonna leave a little bit of time for questions. If anyone has questions, you can start um, getting them in the chat or we can take questions in person in a moment. But if somebody wants to learn more or get involved following this panel, what resources should they check out? I'm thinking of a couple in particular, but hoping that maybe uh, you could highlight some of those. Teachingopensource.org. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, great place to start, which includes a mailing list, which is pretty low traffic, but I would say, like, it's a, I find it to be one of the like, lowest traffic, highest value <laughs> mailing list that I've ever been on. <laughs> a lot of really good connections happening there. Yeah. Anything else? Are, are Posse workshops still running right now? Posse, uh, we ran a Posse. Posse is the professor's open source software experience. It's a faculty development workshop that we've run for quite a few years. And some people like Mel, I see on the list on the, the, the uh, Zoom here today was involved in very early versions of that. Uh, it keeps evolving. Um, we ran one in June. We had not run them during COVID. Uh, we finally got one going then. Um, we're hoping to run one um, in the UK um, next uh, first half of next year, probably, um, with some help from the Open UK folks. Um, so yeah, they're going. They're not as frequently as, as they were in, in for a while there in the past because we've had a lot of COVID interruption. You know, um, that's that's fine, but, but I, and I don't know how the policy has changed, but, but when I looked at it in the early days, it was mostly about teaching professors how to do open source development. Uh, and, and so what I would recommend for somebody wanting to learn more is to go to one of the open source summits run by the Linux Foundation. Okay, they have an academic price, they have a mix of um, non-commercial and commercial projects. They have hundreds of talks and they have a commercial exhibit. And the commercial exhibit includes, again, um, projects that are not aimed at making money and, and some others that are, of course. But it's a really, it's a big event. It goes on for several days. 
uh, and you really get a sense of the scope of what's going on in open source and the various projects. And uh, you can make connections as a, as a faculty member with uh, CTOs and leads of projects uh, who um, you know, have been doing this for a while. Uh, so um, uh, that's where I would suggest that they start. And, and as a, as a follow on to that, Tony, the All Things Open Conference is a similar along the line. Um, I haven't been to it. It's in North Carolina, so uh, no. Yeah. <laughs> but um, it was it was online and free. I actually asked all my students to to go to pick any session they wanted to attend and write a brief paragraph of their experiences. That's a good idea. I've talked to Todd several times, the lead organizer. Uh, but getting out, I think the message that you were both saying is get out there in the world interact with companies and projects and learning how to program in Python, you know, it's a little piece of it, uh, but knowing, you know, what are the projects that are out there in the world that use Python, uh, then you get a different experience. Yeah, I think those are all great places to start. I mean, I'll add to you, I've I participated in a, a few Posse events and workshops, um, which is how I know um, a few of our panelists. And uh, one thing that I did find, I found many things about that extraordinarily helpful, but um, I found it very helpful to be learning some of the tools to help diffuse. I mean, I think somebody even said it earlier in the chat, just how frustrating navigating like the pull request uh, sort of workflow can be with students. So I think it just helped me to find community around some of those tools, even though they are things that you can go learn on your own. Doing it with faculty felt really unique um, and helpful to me. And opensource.com is a great resource too. Yeah, oh, one more thing too. I don't think anyone's mentioned this is that uh, the last to serve wiki has a wealth of individual activity, well, things ranging from individual activities to like links to whole semester long courses. So that's a really great resource too. I built, when I built my open source course, I, I used that as my foundation. Um, all those teaching materials are, you know, free for other instructors to adopt. Um, many of them have been developed during like curriculum sprints with other faculty members. Um, so that's another great place to get started. And, um, Oh, great. Stephanie is highlighting a couple of questions in Slack. We have a few minutes left. Um, the, are there specific technical skills, perhaps beyond those taught in a standard development course, that are particularly useful for students working on open source? In so I, yeah. I think some of that has gone by already, but I'll highlight it. Most of it, it seems to revolve around the process issues and the team issues. Students are used to doing um, their own programs in a relatively isolated environment. The need to collaborate with other people, all the things tied to um, Git-based workflow kind of issues, how to use an issue tracker. They, they know all those things. If you ask a student, do you understand GitHub? They'll say, all say yes. Mm -hmm. but when, you, when you actually see what they do with it, they don't understand how to use it to, to really support a team. So there's huge learning there for almost all students, I think. I think, you know, it's an example of going from being an individual developer to working as part of a group and there's a comment about distributed development environments, but it's distributed teams that is uh, an issue. You know, you're working with a bunch of people that you've never met and are unlikely to ever meet, and yet you're all working toward the same goal. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have another question. Um, what is the experience of students working with standard documentation formats? For example, GitHub Readme's, TWiki's, Read the Docs. Have there been any new ideas leveraging screencasting or videos for documentation? I'm not sure I understand the question. Are we talking? I follow up because that was my okay. Question. Perfect. Thanks. So, <laughs> what I was thinking is, um, in other classes, I adopted some of our materials so that they're more focused on people that prefer media, visual media, as opposed to written documentation. 
And I wonder if that was an initiative that anybody's pursuing in education for open source. You know, for example, it could be a, a screencast of somebody going through the, the process of a, a pull request or or, yeah, I mean, there, there certainly are lots of resources that exist, you know, on YouTube and, and publicly available sources that address things that are relevant to open source courses. I've used some of those. Get get based workflows, um, licensing and copyright issues. There, there's some good materials like that for students who want to watch something rather than read. I actually think that's a really good idea for for like possible contribution, right? Students yeah. could students could create a pull request and video it for a particular project and then contribute that back as part of the, here's how you do it. I love it. Yeah, yeah. Are there any, in, anyone in person who has a question? I realized I was. And okay. yes, definitely make the materials accessible. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Captions and transcriptions, yes, absolutely. Tony touched briefly on licensing. You said that you bring in an attorney when you do it. Is that like a one day thing or how often do you reiterate the importance of licensing? Uh, so, uh, no, we do it very quickly. Um, so uh, I've, I've had Heather Meeker come in and Heather has of course written extensively on this uh, and she actually works now part-time with um, an open source venture capital. If you go with it, oss.capital um, and um, she just knows this stuff in and out because she's written a lot of these licenses, both the open source ones and the server side ones. And so we can go very quickly over the six or seven major ones from permissive to restrictive. Uh, but then some of the subtleties uh, you know, come up and why do you choose one over another? And we do it in, you know, we cover those points really in an hour or two, uh, just to augment what they can read about, you know, and I, I don't suggest that they go to the uh, OSI, tokensource.org and, and read licenses. I mean, they can if they're gluttons for punishment, but um, <laughs> you can read the BSD license, <laughs> that's easy. Uh, so, um, uh, but, um, you know, what happens is it, it then carries over into the whole OSPO discussion because companies are deciding, you know, when they have an open source project office, they have to make some decisions about what licenses are going to be permissible for things that they use internally, things that they distribute to customers, and for things that their employees develop that are going to be part of some external project. Uh, all of these things come into play. So giving them that awareness that when you're doing open source development, you got to pick a license or you, when you're adopting something, you have to be aware of what the license is. And that doesn't take a long time. It just says, ah, you know, open source project license. And now even GitHub for the past six or seven years has given you a chooser. So when you start a project, you can say, okay, this is the license I want. And they have a little bit of an explainer. Um, so uh, that's pretty good. Yeah, thank you. Are we out of time, Stephanie? Yeah, close to it. Maybe you have one more question. One more question? Okay. Um, so I also want to highlight too, there's a lot more interesting resources in the chat. I know, so I'm going to make sure that gets captured in, in the notes. Perfect. Yeah. So there's a lot of really good, like links to conferences and resources and like a ton of stuff flying by. So if you're interested in this topic, um, there will also be another uh, session tomorrow that's a little bit related, but please go look back through the chat. Um, okay. So our last question, I don't know um, if any of you were here for uh, Demetrius's keynote. Um, so there's a question here that says, for those who were in Demetrius's keynote, it sounds like the idea of being all in, supporting the students is a very core concept. Do you find it harder or about the same to support students working in open source compared to other students at your schools? I guess maybe you could speak Can to you, that question even if you 
didn't I was gonna say yeah I was not I had I was teaching during the keynote this morning so I wasn't able to attend um I think that I'll go back to the expectations that there's in some cases higher student frustration and so it's a different kind of support it's a navigating the how to enter a professional environment type of support Absolutely. Anyone else before we wrap up? Okay, great. great. Well, thank you, uh, especially to our panelists, <laughs> three of you joining us remotely from um, Eastern time zone. <laughs> and thank you also to Tony for being here in person um, and to everyone who contributed a lot of really good resources in the chat as well. So. Thank you, Emily. Oh, I get to go teach. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody's got to be teaching right now.